Oh, hey, I was just looking at my favorite star, our sun. I can view it through our telescope with a special solar filter. That's right, our sun is one of trillion stars in the universe. The sun and stars is our topic for this Cerritos Library Universe of Learning virtual program. We will be referencing two books for this program, Astronaut Travel Guide, The Sun by Nick Hunter, and Space Atlas, A Journey from Earth to the Stars and Beyond by Tom Jackson and illustrated by Anna Georgievic. The sun is 93 million miles from Earth. Traveling to the sun would be roughly the same distance as traveling around the Earth's equator almost 4,000 times. A probe traveling at 15,000 miles per hour would take just under one month to reach the sun. However, at current speeds for a spacecraft carrying crew members, the journey would last around six months. The sun measures 866,000 miles in diameter. Earth would fit inside the sun about one million times. The sun is, however, big enough to give out huge amounts of energy, which gives us the light and heat that keeps everything alive on Earth. It is mostly made up of hydrogen and helium gas, which is the fuel that generates all its energy. It contains 99% of all matter in our solar system. Although ancient people knew the importance of the sun, they knew little about it. They did not understand that Earth's journey around the sun was the driving force behind the years and seasons, nor did they know how the sun produced so much energy. Ancient people thought the sun orbited the Earth. Over the centuries, astronomers were able to find out more about the features on the surface of the sun, such as sunspots, solar flares, and the corona, the outer atmosphere of the sun. This glowing cloud of tiny gas particles, the corona, begins as much as one million miles from the surface of the sun. The corona can be as hot as the center of the sun, with temperatures reaching millions of degrees Fahrenheit. The corona can only be seen from Earth when the bright disk of the sun is obscured by the moon. If you could travel through the corona, you would come to the inner atmosphere of the sun, which is called the chromosphere. Its temperature is about 14,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The fiery chromosphere is shaken by violent explosions called solar flares. Solar flares are huge eruptions of gas from the sun and can reach temperatures of up to 180 million degrees Fahrenheit. Solar flares don't just affect the area around the sun, their impact is felt on Earth and across the solar system. The solar wind that is created by the flares is a constant flow of radiation and atomic particles from the sun into the solar system. Solar flares throw out massive quantities of these particles, making the solar wind even stronger. Earth's magnetic field and atmosphere protect us from the solar wind. However, effects from solar winds can be seen in the northern and southern lights, aurora borealis and aurora australis. These shimmering patterns of light appear close to the north and south poles, at the northern and southern ends of Earth's axis. You might also see prominences soaring up from the chromosphere. These prominences are pillars of glowing, superheated gas. Unlike solar flares, which are quick explosions that last four minutes, prominences eruptions can last for days and soar hundreds of thousands of miles into space. Beyond the chromosphere is the surface of the sun called the photosphere. Although referred to as the surface, you could not actually land there. The surface is made up of gases rather than the rocky crust of planets like Earth. The photosphere is where the heat and light that radiates out into the solar system come from and is the part of the sun that can be seen from Earth. When you get closer to the surface, it appears to be covered in patches of different colors. These patches are caused by the streams of incredibly hot material rising from the sun's core to the relatively cool surface. Of course, at around 9,900 degrees Fahrenheit, it is not that cool. The photosphere also features darker patches called sunspots. While sunspots may look small compared to the huge size of the sun, many are bigger than Earth. They change size as they move across the photosphere. Samuel Hedwig Schwab, an amateur German astronomer, observed that the number of the size of sunspots followed a pattern that repeated itself about every 11 years. These patterns give the sun seasons. Although sunspots themselves are cooler, more heat reaches Earth from the sun when there is greater sunspot activity. The next layer we have is the core of the sun. 
This is where the action happens. At temperatures of around 27 million degrees Fahrenheit, the Sun generates the light and heat to Earth and all the other planets in the solar system. The light and heat take hundreds of thousands of years to make their way from the core to the surface. The Sun generates this energy by a process called nuclear fusion. Atoms are the tiny units that make up all matter. At incredibly high temperatures, the hydrogen atoms that make up most of the Sun can fuse or join together to make helium. When this happens, energy is released. When millions of tons of hydrogen atoms are fusing in the Sun every second, the amount of energy released is enormous. Like other stars, the Sun began life inside a swirling cloud of dust called a nebula. A clump of gas and dust formed and grew larger and larger. Gravity pulled the material closer together. The pressure and temperature at the center of the clump grew. When it got hot enough, nuclear fusion reactions started. Energy was released into space and the Sun started to shine. The new Sun burned brightly for millions of years. This is the stage our Sun is at now. As it gets older, its fuel will begin to run out and it will become less bright. A medium-sized star like our Sun shines for about 10 billion years. More massive stars use up their fuel more quickly so they have shorter lives. As the Sun's fuel runs out, the dying Sun will get bigger and become a red giant. Its outer layers of gas will start to escape into space. The material left behind will shrink to form a white dwarf. White dwarfs are about the size of a planet, but they are very dense. The white dwarf cools down and stops shining. It becomes a black dwarf and almost invisible. Astronomers know about the likely future of the Sun from studying the fate of similar stars. Now let's talk about stars. Beyond the solar system, there are no planets, asteroids, or comets for billions or even trillions of miles. If a spacecraft could travel as fast as a beam of light, it would travel through the emptiness for more than four years before reaching the nearest star, Proxima Centauri. Proxima means nearest. Proxima Centauri is part of a star system called Alpha Centauri. A star system is a small number of stars that orbit each other. Alpha Centauri contains three stars. Alpha Centauri A and B, and Proxima Centauri, which is about 560 billion miles closer to Earth than the other two. Most stars are dwarf stars, including our Sun. Red dwarf stars, like Proxima Centauri, are the most common stars. Astronomers divide stars into two main types, dwarfs and giants. Dwarfs are smaller and less bright than giants, but they shine for a longer amount of time. The color of light from a star tells astronomers how large and hot it is. Dwarf stars last for billions of years, but they don't last forever. A dwarf star is a ball of hydrogen gas. It uses hydrogen to give off heat and light by turning it into helium, a heavier gas. When the star runs out of hydrogen, it uses the helium instead. This makes the star swell into a red giant. A red giant burns for about 500 million years. Then the star breaks up, blasting gas into space to create a planetary nebula. Eventually, all that is left of the dying star is a tiny hotspot called a white dwarf. A white dwarf cools down and will eventually stop giving out heat and light. But no white dwarf has cooled down to this point yet. It would take a million billion years and the universe is only 13.8 billion years old. To see what happens when a dwarf star dies, we need to travel to a gas cloud called NGC 2392 Nebula. This colorful cloud formed when a star like the Sun started to die. The nebula was discovered by William Herschel in 1787. Nebula means cloud in Latin. This nebula is a planetary nebula, which is a confusing name as these clouds of gas have nothing to do with planets. Space telescopes allow astronomers to take amazing photos of planetary nebulas and other distant objects. Telescopes orbit in space outside the Earth's atmosphere, where their images are not spoiled by pollution and city lights. Their cameras can pick up energy waves that would be blocked by the Earth's atmosphere. A nebula is not just a place where a star dies. It is also where stars are born. The Carina Nebula is one of these star-making nebulas. It is 10,000 light years away from Earth but is so enormous that it fills a patch of sky four times bigger than a full moon. The Carina Nebula is only visible from the southern hemisphere, where the nebula is bright enough to see cloudy smudges of gas and bright clusters of stars without a telescope. Astronomers study the distant nebula to learn about how stars are made. A thick cloud of electrified gas and dust inside the Carina Nebula begins to form a clump. 
the clump shrinks in on itself, forming a bigger, brighter ball. The ball starts to spin around and warm up, sending out jets of gas from its north and south poles. These jets blow away the surrounding cloud. The new star is surrounded by a dusty disk. Planets form in the disk, slowly creating a new solar system. This is how our solar system formed about 4.6 billion years ago. Near the center of the Carina Nebula is the Mystic Mountain. This is a pointed cloud three light years long. Inside are several young stars that are blasting out jets of gas, which will eventually blow the Mystic Mountain cloud away. It is hard to imagine just how huge the Sun is compared to Earth. However, the Sun is tiny compared to the biggest stars. VY Canis Majoris is a hypergiant, one of the largest stars of all. It gives out the same amount of light as 250,000 suns. However, the star is nearly 4,000 light years away, which means it is too faint to see without a telescope. If we could bring the VY Canis Majoris to our solar system and replace the sun with it, the star would swallow up all the rocky planets and the asteroid belt, leaving Jupiter and Saturn to combine and become the first planet. At 1,420 times the size of the sun, there are fewer than 100,000 stars this size. VY Canis Majors is part of the Canis Major constellation. When they die, giant stars do not fade away in pretty clouds of gas like smaller stars. Instead, they die in the largest explosions ever seen. The explosions are so bright that stars that were once too dim to be seen from Earth suddenly appear in our sky as a bright flash known as a supernova. It takes the sun 10 million years to give off the same amount of light that comes from a supernova all at once. In 1054, astronomers in China made notes about a guest star appearing in the sky. Today, astronomers think it was a supernova. The supernova's light faded away 642 days later, but left behind a vast twisted cloud known as the Crab Nebula. The Crab Nebula is a cloud of gas and dust that is now too faint to see without a telescope. However, it is about a sixth of the size of the moon when seen from Earth. In fact, it is more than twice as big as the solar system. We are able to see these stars by using specialized telescopes such as NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory, which was launched from the space shuttle in 1999. Its instruments pick up X-rays from super hot parts of the universe, such as exploding stars. X-rays are a type of energy that is invisible to humans. Any star that is 1.5 times heavier than the sun will end up with a supernova. When it runs out of fuel, the weight of the dead star is so great that it collapses in on itself. This crushes everything in the star's core, giving out a great flash of energy. What is left behind is usually a tiny object called a neutron star. A neutron star weighs more than the sun, but is only 12 miles wide. Large stars become neutron stars. Massive stars become black holes. Pulsars are a type of neutron stars. These are small but heavy stars that are made inside a supernova explosion. All pulsars are neutron stars, but not all neutron stars are pulsars. Pulsars are neutron stars that rotate while sending out pulses of energy. In 1967, LGM-1 was the first pulsar to be discovered by Jocelyn Bell Burnell and Anthony Hewish. When they picked up a radio signal every 1.3 seconds, they joked it might be coming from aliens, or little green men. When they figured out the source of the energy was a pulsar, they named it LGM, short for little green men. The first pulsars were found by scanning the sky for radio waves using radio telescopes. However, astronomers have now found pulsars that send out beams of other invisible waves of energy. The fastest spinning pulsars contain so much energy that they blast out gamma rays, which are normally present inside nuclear power plants. Others produce beams of X-rays, like the invisible waves used by doctors to take pictures of bone inside a person's body. There are even a few pulsars that flash light that we can see. Though they are so far away, they are only visible using a powerful telescope. That brings us to our swirling spiral of stars, gas, and dust called the Milky Way. The Milky Way is our galaxy and home to our solar system. Although we can never see the whole Milky Way from our planet, we can look into its center. This appears as a strip so thick with stars that they create a pale stripe across the night sky. The ancient Chinese called it the Silver River and Vikings called it Winter Street. 
The ancient Greeks said it was the milk circle, while the Romans preferred the Milky Way. The Greek word for milk, galaxias, gave us the word galaxy. I hope you learned a bit about our star, the sun, and about the other types of stars there are in our great big universe. Mr. Shell is going to show you how to make your own sun flare picture and how to use NASA's recoloring the universe with pencil code. And while you do that, I think I'm gonna take another look. Enjoy. Hello everyone, my name is Miss Rochelle. Today we'll be creating a solar clock and a sun paper. I will also show you how to recolor images of supernova remnant KES73 using pencil code. Join me in the high tech lab and we'll get started. Today we will be using Recoloring the Universe with Pencil Code to recolor the images of supernova remnant KES73. To locate the website for Recoloring the Universe, go to cerritoslibrary.us. Under the What's New tab, click on the link for the Cerritos Library Universe of Learning virtual programs. The link for Recoloring the Universe will be located under the R Star The Sun program. Once you're on the website, you can scroll down to explore the pencil code platform and coding activities. We are going to do lesson number six and recolor a supernova. After you click on supernova, you will see the code for the image. The starter code has four grayscale images. Each of these images has only one input. These inputs are infrared, optical, radio, and x-ray. These are four different kinds of light from four telescopes. Different combinations of the colorized grayscale images produce color that reveal specific information about the stars, gas, and dust in space. Changing the number values will change how much of what type of light you will see and change the color of the image. So with these numbers, you will create an image with, for KES 73. You can go in and change the number values to change the image. You can also change around the red, blue, and green colors. Then it will give you a different color for your KES 73 image. I hope you enjoyed using code to create your own colorful image of KES 73. There are other fun coding projects on Hour of Code that you may enjoy using. The materials you will need to make a sun paper are paper, scissors, tape, cardboard or squeegee, red and yellow food coloring, wax paper, a toothpick, and shaving cream. The first step is taking wax paper and taping it down to the table. Once we have that done, we're going to take the shaving cream and you have it on a circular pattern, just like that. To make it a perfect circle, you have to get your hand a little messy and try to make the best circle you can with the shaving cream. Just like that. After you wash your hands, the next step is to take the food coloring and place five drops in a circular pattern on the shaving cream. Then I'm going to take the toothpick and swirl around the food coloring. Then we're going to take the paper and place it on top of the shaving cream. And press it down. And you pick up the paper. And 
you have this, we're going to take the excess shaving cream off with the cardboard. Then you're going to set it aside and let it dry. Then once it's dried, you're going to cut out the circle so you have your sun. And then it should end up looking like this. Our next activity will be a solar clock. The materials you'll need for this activity are tape, scissors, and the printout for the solar clock. You can locate the solar clock activity by going to cerritoslibrary.us. Under the What's New tab, click on the link for the Cerritos Library Universe of Learning virtual programs. The link for the solar clock activity will be located under the R Star The Sun program. The first step is to cut along the marked line. Next, cut along the middle line up to the small cross line on the base. For the gnomon, we're going to cut off the two areas labeled discard. We're also going to cut off the little piece right here. Now we're going to fold it right in the middle on the broken line. Next we're going to cut along the curved line and keep cutting until you reach the broken line. Then we're going to fold the line right here. Then also fold this line right here. And bring it right this way. We have it folded flat. We're going to take the base and slide it into the fin. The fin must be perpendicular to the base. And on the bottom, you can tape the fin to the base. The sundial is now ready. Let's go outside and see how it works. Once you take your solar clock outside, you will need to orient the fin to point north. The shadow of the tip of the fin now tells the time. As you can see, the shadow is at 10 and it is currently 10 o'clock right now. Thank you for joining us for our program about the sun. We hope you had a good time watching. Bye bye.